I'd like to read first of all in the Bible, in the book of Acts and chapter 10. <clears throat> book of Acts chapter 10. Please remember that this meeting is part of a series of meetings continuing uh, until Friday of this week at 7.30 p.m. And we'll be glad to see you come back in the Lord's will. Acts chapter 10, and we will read verse 42. Peter is speaking here, and he says, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the living and dead. And over to the Gospel of John in chapter 5. John chapter 5, and we'll read from verse 22. It says, For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son, honors not the Father, which has sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life, shall not come into condemnation or shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. That is all we'll read. <clears throat> now, here in the gospel today, I want you to just for the opening part of this meeting, I want you to think about the subject of judgment. That is what we have read here today. Uh, Peter says in the book of Acts chapter 10 that the message he was sent to preach to all people was that God has appointed a man who will judge the living and the dead. That is what he was sent to preach, to proclaim, which is what we're doing here tonight, preaching. And so let's just look at that for these few minutes together. What does that mean, this idea of judgment? I think, first of all, you will understand that while we are very glad to see everyone who's come, to, come out tonight and make you very welcome, when somebody is being judged, in this sense of the word, when it's a judge sitting on a throne, if you will, or it's a very solemn thing, right? It's a very serious thing when you go before the court of law. They still wear the special gowns. Uh, there's still likely police officers present, right? And it's not a time to joke around too much. It's not a time for too much levity or lightness. Uh, judgment and standing before a judge is a very serious thing, whether it's standing before a judge when it comes to a speeding ticket or anything even more severe. And I want you to understand that when the gospel is being preached, it is a very serious thing to listen to the gospel. It's a very serious thing for us to preach it. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians said that when he went to preach the gospel, he did so with trembling and with fear because he understood that what he was doing was he was presenting to people eternal realities like what's at stake in this meeting is your never-ending soul and the stakes for your soul is heaven or hell and so it is a very uh, serious solemn sobering thing uh, to think of these things judgment when it comes to this verse in acts 10 that the Lord Jesus was appointed. He was set up to be the judge. It wasn't going to be the father, God the father. It was going to be his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is going to be the judge of all the earth, the living and the dead. That might be something you never knew about the Lord Jesus. I mean, we think of Jesus perhaps as the baby in Bethlehem's manger. He was the miracle worker who went through Nazareth and uh, region at that day, a great teacher, a very kind man. He hung on a cross with shame, spitting. Perhaps you've never thought that that Jesus has been appointed as the judge of the living and the dead. And that would include, which brings me to my first point here, that would include every single one of us in this tent tonight. This judgment is a scope that uh, couldn't be any wider. It includes the living and the dead. It includes every man and woman 
Every boy and girl on planet Earth today, there's no distinction based on race or socioeconomic status or any of those things. No, this judgment that is going to take place includes every single person. So my friend, it includes you. Have you ever stopped to think that there is a day in which you will have to give an account for what you have done? For your sin. There is a judge. And Peter says, I was sent to preach that God had appointed this man as judge for the living and the dead. A scope that couldn't be wider. The second thing I want you to notice is that it's a, there is a sentence that this judge has passed that couldn't be clearer. Sometimes we uh, talk to people from time to time. And it's a very popular notion that really how life works is you are born in this world and you're dealt the hand you're dealt. You've got a privileged hand, good for you. If you don't, too bad. And you live your life and really how it works is you're good and you're bad. Send you out to meet God for a final judgment. Where he will weigh your good and then he will weigh your bad and whichever weighs more determines where you go now i want to tell you plainly kindly that's not found in the bible in the bible the judgment has already been announced in the bible the book of romans chapter 3 it says this every mouth is stopped all the world guilty before God. It says in the Bible that we are already condemned. So you see this idea that I have to wait to meet God to find out what is my sentence going to be? How is he going to judge me? Friends today, if that's your confusion, I can tell you, you don't have to be confused anymore. The Bible has made it very clear. I don't have to know you. I don't have to know what you have done. You don't have to know me and know what I have done to know this. The Bible says all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person, without exception, without distinction, there is no difference, says the, uh, the author of Romans 3. And so when it comes to the judgment, the sentence has already been leveled. It says that the soul that sins must die. You see, the judge, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we have read here, even in John chapter 5, he is the judge. We are already, every one of us in this tent, we're in our sins. Every, every one of you here tonight who do not know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. You can know this as an absolute fact. You are condemned already. You don't have to wait to figure out whether you will be condemned. Right now in this tent, according to the words of Christ, we actually heard them the very first night. He that believeth not is condemned already. The wrath of God abides on him. Like a, like a cloud over an individual in this seat, in your seat. And so this is a sentence that couldn't be clearer. All the world is guilty. Everyone's mouth is stopped, including my own. Every single person on planet Earth, the sentence is absolutely clear. You know this, that when it comes to guilt, it's not one of those like vague things, right? Like, like guilt is either guilty or not guilty. Right. Like so if, if we were to take the the crime or the sin of lying, there is lying to mom and dad so you don't get in trouble. Right. Then there is a little bit more in severity lying on your taxes. Then there's an even increased severity lying under oath, like in the judgment that we're talking about. You're sworn to take an oath. And so there's different severities of the crime. But if the judge brought you forward. And if the crime was thou shalt not lie, you plead guilty or not guilty. That's it. And even if it's lying to mom and dad, how would you have to plead? Guilty. And that's why it says here, it's not a, diff it's not a difficult thing to understand. It's not a difficult thing to understand. Every one of us have sinned. Every one of us are sentenced under this condemnation. Guilty already. Deserving death. It is a death penalty for sin, according to the Bible. 
from the very first sin that entered planet Earth. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 5, as by one man, sin came into the world and death because of sin. Death passed on all men for all of sin. And so it is a death penalty for sin. So when it comes to judgment, the solemn thing, very serious thing to think that actually the God I'm going to meet is not the grandfather in the sky. The God I'm going to meet is not the celestial Santa Claus. I am going to meet the judge of all the earth. He is going to hold me accountable for my personal sins. And when it comes to the scope, every single person in this tent, every single person from the youngest boy to the oldest man, regardless of religious affiliation, regardless of church membership, regardless of whether you've been baptized, regardless of any special verse you may have, regardless of how many songs you enjoy to sing, every single person, according to the book, was guilty. My friend, if you've never faced the fact that you were guilty, I would invite you and ask you to face that today. Every one of us, guilty before God, before the judge. And so the sentence couldn't be clearer. That brings me, that brings me to my last point. The point I would delight to tell you about. Not just its scope and its sentence, but what we've sung about. Saved. Salvation. You know, not too long ago, just before coming here, actually, I walked around a cemetery in the city where I'm from, Jackson, Michigan. And uh, I was looking for a very specific uh, tombstone, uh, somebody I knew quite well, but I couldn't uh, place it. And it just amazed me, if you've ever walked around the cemetery, that a human life is a name, two dates. And then maybe kind mother, maybe military award, maybe son, uh, a great singer, maybe a little quote on the back, but really all of human life, all of our lives, we will one day be there if the Lord has not come, will be summarized by a name. And then two dates about a beginning and then the death. And as I looked at it and I was looking for this grave and I couldn't find it, I went searching, hunting for one word. Saved. Saved. I looked and I found different things that would describe people. But as I looked different places, I couldn't find my word. Some had other expressions, resting in peace and various things like that. But then I found one. Gone to be. With his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Another one, I saw just a picture of it. It said this. The man put this on his tombstone. A great sinner. A greater Savior. Save. Oh, I tell you tonight, if only I could tell you that the great news of the gospel is how the judge has moved and made a way for people to be saved. Saved from that judgment. Isn't that what we read in John chapter 5? John chapter 5 and verse 24. There is a group of people, and this is what it says about them. Shall not come into judgment. Saved. Saved from it. That's what it means to be saved, my friend. It means to be rescued from what? From the judgment. That's what it says right here on this verse beside me. That sinners who should be judged for their sin by this judge that we have read up tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save them, to save them from that judgment. You say, how could he do it? Well, the great message of the gospel is that the way he did it was by taking the judgment himself. He came into the world sinless. There was never a time where he would stand before the bar of God and have to say guilty. He would never have a moment where he had to confess for his sins or, or repent or say he was sorry. 
This was a man who lived blameless, spotless, sinless on a very polluted planet Earth. Yet as he journeys there, even his enemies said, even his enemies, he's done all things well. No fault, no accusation. And as they take him outside the city to Calvary, they drive nails into his hands and into his feet. I was just reading a very interesting story in the book of Judges for a woman named Jael. She had one job and she nailed it, if you know what I mean, those of you who know the story. She drove a nail, a tent bag, through a man who was a very wicked man, a king, Cicero. And he was killed. And in my mind, I just thought about the contrast between this wicked man and the spotless, sinless son of God. Not a ruthless ruler like Sisera, yet he took the nails, his hands and feet, hanging there as a public spectacle, criminals on either side, Jesus in the midst. Why? Let me ask you, all of you here tonight, you've seen crucifixes. You've seen the crosses coming out of churches or around people's necks or on various tattoos. Why the cross? Why? Because that is where, according to the Bible, the Lord laid on him the sin of us all. That is where, according to the Bible, he became accountable for our sin, where he was judged. The judge. The judge was judged for our sin so that we wouldn't have to be. And at the end of it, he said, it's all done. It's finished. There's nothing left. Everything was settled. Oh, that's how it can happen. That's how you can be part of this group. Listen, listen to what it says. Just as I sit down, listen to what it says. Truly, this is a true statement. I'm saying this to you. It says the Lord Jesus, he that hears my word. And believes God has everlasting love and will not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. What word do you need to hear? You need to hear the word of the cross, the word of the cross, the word where the judgment was taken, where the bomb, the atomic bomb of God's judgment was absorbed in one man. And then he rose again from the dead, dismantling the bomb in mighty power. Tonight we preach the risen ascended Lord Jesus Christ and there is victory over sin he has broken its power he can break the power of sin in every life present in this tent tonight break it destroy it because he took the bomb of sin he took the the explosion as it funneled all of God's judgment that should have funneled on me it funneled on Christ he absorbed it he died under its penalty rose again storm was calm storm was calm forever you see there's nothing you can add to that my friend there's nothing you can try to say well i'll do this or i'll do that no my friend jesus paid it all all to him i owe sin had left the crimson stain he washed it white as snow oh my friend here tonight this is the great news of the gospel how that you and i myself born into this world as a sinner living guilty before God of all kinds of offenses, crimes. Oh, it can all be swept away because it was washed away by the blood of Christ who took those sins on himself, the judgment taken. And so somebody was asking us just not too, too long ago, a couple nights ago, how can it be that a Christian says that I'm saved? I had this moment, I'm, I'm saved and Never fall out of it. Don't you have to keep going? Don't you have to keep performing? No, my friend, because the performance was done. Christ performed. He settled it. He absorbed the judgment. Our only hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has done it all. And so when it comes to this message of the judge, there is a way for you today to escape, to be saved, to be removed from going towards judgment. How does it happen? This is what you have to do. 
hear my word. Is there perhaps a young man here tonight? And you have sat in gospel meetings as far back as you can remember. And I tell you, as someone who's done the same, one of the things you might have never done is actually take time to listen. Because you've always heard, it seems. You know it all so well. My friend, just take time to listen to what God is saying. Your sin must be judged by a holy God. God has provided his son to take the judgment for you. What you are called upon to do is hear his word. Rest in what God says. What does it say? I love this. Shall not come into judgment. Impossible. Can't happen. Shall not come into judgment. Why? Because the judgment is taken. Would you turn please to the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And the last verse in the chapter, verse 23. Romans 6 and 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Those are 20 words that blow completely out of the water all our ideas of how to be saved. I want to begin where my brother, Mr. Baker, closed. And I want to talk to you for a few minutes about God's salvation. And you will notice, first of all, that this wonderful gift of salvation is just that. It is a gift. Now, everybody likes free. Long time ago, merchants realized it resonated more with buyers if they said buy one, get one free, than if they said 50% off. That word free triggers something in our mind. Just be at Costco or Sam's, once they completely start with the free samples again, and you will see the line. Everybody likes free. But it is amazing. That when it comes to the most important thing of all, very few people realize that salvation is free. Free. So the next time a collection plate is passed under your nose, will you remember that the Bible says salvation is free? That the next time you find a person who thinks that they could get to heaven by how they pay or how they pray or what they say or what they do, will you please remember that salvation is free? Notice the giver. It doesn't say that the gift of the church is eternal life, as though some organization could bestow eternal life on its followers. It doesn't say that the gift of a preacher is eternal life, as though if you came forward tonight and somehow Mr. Baker or I could bestow some blessing on you, we can't give you eternal life. You see, that was a fallacy that years ago, some very well-known evangelists, unfortunately, bought into. They didn't believe that man was a sinner, a ruined sinner. They imagined that a person could become saved if you could just conquer his will. If you made him willing to be saved, he'd be saved. And so they initiated things like the altar call and the prayer bench. And people would come forward and they'd be told that they were saved because they had expressed a desire to become saved. But will you notice that this is not the gift of a man? It's not the gift of a preacher. It's not the gift of a church. It is the gift of God. So ask yourself the question, has there been a time in your life somewhere in this wide world where you received eternal life salvation from God? Religion is filled with rules and regulations to follow. God's salvation is simple. It's simple because Christ did all the work at Calvary, all of the suffering required, all the payment demanded when he died for our sins, according to the scriptures. I read the account of a, a rabbi who was in Kowloon, Hong Kong for a, a vacation, and he was staying at the Holiday Inn. His room was on the 11th floor. He was in the lobby on the Saturday to go up to his room. That is the Jewish Sabbath. He can't press the button on the elevator because that's work. He can't initiate something that involves labor. So he had to walk up the stairs. 
He's on the 11th floor. Making his way up. Puffing and puffing. Got to the 10th floor. Started up another flight of stairs. Got up to the, close to the 11th floor. And he said a waiter from the hotel's restaurant was coming out of the door and coming down. And he looked at him. And he said, are the, are the elevators broken? Standing there, huffing and puffing and sweating, the rabbi said to him, no, it's our Sabbath. I'm not allowed to work. And he said, the waiter looked at me like I was crazy. Why would walking 11 flights of stairs be less work than pressing an elevator button? But you see, religion is filled, filled with rules and regulations. And if you break them, then you need to start all over again. Here's salvation. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is the giver. Now, the devil has been on a libel and slanderous campaign against God from Genesis chapter 3 till now. He's been remarkably successful with a lot of people because their opinion of God is that God is a strict, stern, rigorous, demanding being. And that really you'd be far happier just to steer clear of him. And maybe when you come to your deathbed, then perhaps maybe you should look into this being called God. But for the most part, if you want a happy life, don't get too close to this God because he's very, very demanding. Do you want to know the opposite? The truth is the opposite. God is the most generous being in the universe. He gave us the planet. The planet. It's hard to imagine how any sincere astronomer could be anything but a believer in God when he looks at the universe around as far as he can gaze. And he sees that in this vast, let me just bring it even to something more manageable, in this vast solar system of ours, there's the blue planet situated exactly where it has to be from the sun in order to have life. Give it an axial tilt so that we have seasons. Stop with everything that we require for life. God has given the Bible says God has given it to us freely to enjoy. But beyond that, God gave his son. He gave the Lord Jesus to die because there was no other possible way that you could be the recipient of eternal life. Then he gave us his, his word, the Bible. And what a gift this is. If it weren't for this book, I would know nothing about the Lord Jesus. If it weren't for this book, I would know nothing about how to be saved. But it is this book inspired by God that imparts the information that a person needs to find out how she can go to heaven, how he can go to heaven, how you can go to heaven. God is the giver. But please notice the cost. We've already, already been hearing about this in the first part of the meeting, and every gospel meeting includes this. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's what it cost God to be able to offer you salvation tonight. When I only had one child, I have four now, but when I only had one child, my oldest is named Peter. So I guess this kind of resonated with me because the, the uh, man that was writing the article was named Peter. And he was describing what happened to him when he was a teenager. And he was called up to service during the Second World War. And the night before he was to leave, the arrangement was all made. It was, his name was Peter Finley. He wrote for the Philadelphia Inquirer. The arrangement was all made the night before that Peter's father would drive him to where he was to go in the morning. And so everything was taken care of, except that the next morning, Pete's mother was shaking him, saying to him, your dad overslept. He had to leave. You're going to have to grab a bus. So he got on the bus. He went through his backpack while he was on the bus and he found a note from his father. And his father had written this note, Pete, I didn't oversleep. I couldn't bear to say goodbye to you. God bless you and keep you and bring you home safely to us. Got that? He would have known his son for 18 years, 19 years, and he couldn't bear to say goodbye to him. He couldn't bear to think of his boy. 
And that's a natural emotion in the heart of a mother or father. Couldn't bear to think of the boy going into a place of danger and hazard and peril and maybe, maybe losing his life. But please listen to me. God sent his son into a world that was teeming with hatred against him, that was roiling in its opposition to God, sent him to where God knew Christ would die, sent him to where God knew the tree from which a cross would be made on which his son would be impaled and hang between two malefactors and die. And God was willing to pay that price. There's a man in the Old Testament. We had a son named Benjamin, and he was in danger of losing Benjamin. And it was the last thing he wanted to do. Now, he had nine other boys. He actually had ten, but he only thought he had nine other boys. But no matter how many other sons he had, he didn't want to lose one of them. God only had one son. And yet, as the Bible tells you, and it's right here before you, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That verse would be easier to understand if the Lord Jesus said that God had pity on the world, that God saw our deep plight and pitied us. But why would God ever love us so much? Why would God ever love us so much that he would give his son? There's another father in the Old Testament. He had a number of sons. One son tried to kill him. And his army went out against his son's army. And when his son was killed, we learned that David the king would have been happier to lose his crown and his kingdom than for his boy to die. So it didn't matter what other else he lost. He didn't want his son to die. And yet God gave his son. John would write in his first letter, 1 John chapter 4, the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. God was willing to do that. But think about the suffering of the Lord Jesus, the son of God. The Bible reminds us that he suffered for others substitutionally. I can tell you that as a boy of 15 and a half, I discovered that Jesus took my place at Calvary and died for me. And because he died for me, I would not have to perish. I would have everlasting life. He died in my place. There is, there is a sense in which the Lord Jesus died in the place of Barabbas. So the soldier opens the, the cell door and points to Barabbas. And Barabbas thinks he's on the way out to carry his stipes out to Skull Hill to be crucified. And instead, the soldier pushes him down the corridor and says, go, you're free. And the cross that was supposedly for Barabbas is carried by Christ and the nails that were appointed for Barabbas are pounded into the hands and feet of the Lord Jesus and the place in the center that would have had Barabbas's body instead when they were come to the place which is called Calvary there they crucified him and the malefactors one on either side Jesus in the midst now, I'm going to say something that is going to be very difficult for me to even explain. And maybe it'll be hard for you to accept. But the Lord Jesus suffered supremely. He suffered. If I were to tell you that he suffered my hell, I would be minimizing what he endured. He suffered far more than my hell. I'm a finite being. The Lord Jesus is an infinite being. The Lord Jesus suffered infinitely. So please understand me that if all of the human suffering from the Garden of Eden, from chapter 3 on to this day and on till time is done, if you could somehow amass all of the pain and anguish and human suffering that the human race has experienced, if it would be possible for you to somehow gauge how much souls will suffer forever in the lake of fire, and somehow bring all the amalgamation of all that unbelievable, incomprehensible amount of suffering and place it into one spot at one time in history. There it was on that cross. And the son of the most high God endured the totality of God's wrath so that sinners could be saved. I'm glad to tell you that he suffered sufficiently. But what he endured is enough to save you tonight that what he endured has allowed God in a righteous way to offer you 
eternal life. I was about to say it's as actual as my hand, but you see, it's even more than that. I can't reach where you're sitting and my hand is empty. But in reality, the hand of God is offering you eternal life tonight as a gift. Isn't that what the verse says? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He paid the price. And that's why it's a gift for guilty sinners. But I want you to think about the suitability. Because we have all experienced receiving gifts that do not fit, that we do not want, that are like what we already have, the lineups to return things after the Christmas season. You're all familiar with that. And a lot of people think that salvation is okay for some. Like if you're a religious person, that this is all good. You're going to, this is for you. But I've had people say to me, but you know, I'm not like that. I no, and I didn't have a religious bone in my body. There's an old song that says, no place is so dear to my childhood as the little brown church in the veil. There was nothing dear to me about the gospel hall when I was growing up. It meant getting dressed, sitting, couldn't talk, sitting, listening to a man preaching from the Bible. No, I, I thought that the way to be happy was out there away from all of this and out in the world. And I got whatever a little taste of that world I could. And I want to tell you that the night that I first listened to the gospel with my actual ears, listen, I had to admit that I had absolutely nothing, that my life was miserable, that the Christians had something that was real. And I had nothing. There's a man in our Bible called Solomon who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. One Jewish commentator said that the, the best, the closest way that you can get to translating that word, vanity, is to think about soap bubbles. If you tried to grab soap bubbles, you, could, you see how insubstantial it is. And here was a man who had wealth and, and power and position and prestige and fame and success and knowledge. And he said, it's, it's, it's all empty. It's all empty. Vanity of vanities. He said in one of the most poignant statements in all of the word of God, he said, therefore, I hated life. How could a man hate life who had everything that supposedly makes life worth living? Because if you don't have Christ, you have nothing. You have nothing. But this gift. You see, salvation restores to us the purpose of our existence. You were made for God. You were made to know God, to enjoy God, to love God, to serve God, to be loved by God. When you try to live life any other way, it's a, it's a warping. It's a distorting of life. I don't want to give any young children an idea here, but I was having meetings in a place. And I'm very thankful that one of the young men coming to the meetings was honest. And he said to me when the meeting was done, he said, some of the kids put sand in your gas tank. Now, had I started the car and driven, just take my word for it, there would have been damage because a car is not made to drive insane it became an expensive thing to fix but it could have been a lot worse you were not made to live on sin you were not made to live apart from god you were not made to live without knowing that you'll be in heaven and when a person lives that way he doesn't really live he merely exists but salvation brings a person back to God and restores the purpose for which we were made. It brings, it reconciles a person. It removes the enmity that sin created, that, that anger against God that is in our heart when we listen to what God says and we disagree. It removes that and it reserves us a place with him forever. And tonight, that's what God is offering you. There's a lot of other ways I could describe it. There are a lot of other features about it I could tell you, but let's just stop right there. But God is offering you eternal life tonight. God is the giver. The life of Christ was the cost. The suitability is conveyed to us in that frequent gospel Bible verse, whosoever. So no matter who you are, if you trusted Christ tonight, you'd be saved. So who are the recipients? Who gets eternal life? Who has eternal life tonight and who doesn't in this meeting? I don't 
lift your hands. I'm just asking that as a rhetorical question. Well, here is who has eternal life. Everyone who believes on the Son of God. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 1 says, as many as receive Christ, they are born again. They become the children of God. The last verse of John chapter 3 says, he that believes on the Son has everlasting life. I have a dear friend who is now in heaven, just a year or two before he died. He wrote me. And he said, this was at the end of 2017. And he wrote and said that in January, that would be in 2018, January the 23rd, that it would be 75 years since God saved him. So over 75 years, he had been enjoying salvation. I wrote him back, and I'm going to tell you in a moment what he wrote me. I wrote him back, and I said, Jim, I am appointing your testimony as the most succinct testimony I have ever heard. This is what he wrote. Brother Carboni was preaching on trusting the Lord, and I did. That's it. Brother Carboni was speaking on trusting the Lord, and I did. What did he do? He believed on the Son of God. Now, please, we're not trying to get you to join a church. My preaching partner and I, we hope we can't help that. We hope that. What you have listened to is something that reaches your heart. But even beyond that, we want you to have eternal life. God wants you to have eternal life. Christ died so that you could have eternal life. So please, in the quiet of your own heart just now, would you answer this question? Do you have the gift of God, which is eternal life? And if the answer is no, then listen to 20 words once more that will tell you about the wonderful gift that is that God is offering to you tonight. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord.